My name is Deborah Gonzalez. I'm the Government Affairs Director here at uh, the Public Policy, not here, but at the Public Policy Institute of California. And thank you for joining us today. I know it's not our usual location, so we really appreciate you trekking this way and going through security. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with PPIC, we're a nonpartisan, nonprofit think tank with offices both in San Francisco and Sacramento. For today's presentation, we're going to hear from PPIC researcher Dean Bonner, who will present the findings of PPIC's latest survey on Californians and their government. We'd like to thank the James Irvine Foundation and the PPIC Donor Circle for their support of this particular survey. We'd also like to thank the PPIC Donor Circle and the Corporate Circle for helping make this event possible, including the lunch that you got today. At registration, you should have received a document that contains some of the key findings of the survey. The full report and the slides you will see today are online at ppic.org. After Dean's presentation, we'll have plenty of time for question and answers. A couple more things before we begin. Later today, of course, you'll get a survey about the survey. It's what we like to do. And we do actually look at those responses, so please um, fill those out and give them back to us. And please silence your cell phone. So today's poll is one of my favorite in the year, and we do eight polls, so that's like picking your favorite child, but I did it, um, and I've made that mistake with my own children, too, I think. But it's really, there's something for everyone here, which is what I think is exciting about this poll, and it's incredibly timely. Of course, most of the news outlets picked up the governor's race, the horse race, um, and I'm sure that most of the news outlets will focus on it, and the campaigns are focusing on it as we speak. And while there's movement here, it's important to note that only 48% of respondents said they are closely following the race. That's up 18 points from January, but still less than the voters in 2010. It's also important to note that our former frontrunner, Don't Know, still has a quarter of the votes and is only slightly behind the frontrunner. But beyond the election news, there are topics that I know are top of mind right now. For those of you who brave the weather, you know that there's a lot of water out in Sacramento. And just an aside, my water team assures me that it isn't the same March miracle as 1991, and I keep telling them, not yet. But we'll see. Our respondents seem to know that rain, this rain might not be enough. 68% of Californians say water supply is a problem, up 8% from last year. The poll touches on two of the governor's major infrastructure projects, the twin tunnels and high-speed rail, and I think it's safe to say the public likes the vision of these projects, but when it comes to paying for high-speed rail projects, that's another story. It might be something about the 70-plus billion dollar price tag. Speaking of money, and as someone who just completed her taxes, and I'm a little bitter, I just want to say, I'm usually bitter this time of year about that. The tax questions really resonated to me, and Dean will share some important, interesting attitudes on Californians and state taxes, as well as the federal changes that were adopted in December. Californians may see a number of tax measures on the November ballot, so their Californians' attitudes towards tax policy in California may resonate uh, for, and have impacts on this fall. And the survey also was taken during Jeff Sessions' visit to California, and clearly Californians still hold strong views on immigration and federal enforcement. I can go on and on. As you can see, there's a wide variety of topics. And for a person like me who is self-diagnosed adult ADD, it's a fabulous survey. But I really want to commend you to look at our polling online. All of our poll is, uh, data is online. All of our questions and all of our cross-tabs, both of likely voters and all Californians, we poll for both. And I just think you'll find a really rich uh, amount of understanding about our poll question here. So with that, I'd like to invite Dean up to the podium. Thank you very much, Deborah. And like the lesser child of the family, I will strive hard to make sure that May will be a survey even better than this one so that you have to choose that one. Um, I'll also echo her sentiments about the crosstabs that are online as well as the raw data that will be up in about six months. The crosstabs are, we provide them for every question, for every survey among likely voters and all adults. So if you have any questions that I don't answer here, uh, um, you can always go see how kind of renters versus owners or you know, men versus women or any number of uh, demographics. So. 
So this survey uh, is a part of a series, and overall, the statewide survey mission is to provide timely, relevant, and nonpartisan data on a variety of political, social, and economic opinions. Um, our goal is to inform and improve state policymaking, raise awareness, and encourage discussion. And uh, we've done that since 1998, providing a voice for over 345,000 Californians in uh, well over 160 surveys. This particular series, as Deborah noted, is funded by the James Irvine Foundation and the PPIC don Donor Circle. Interviews took place earlier this month from uh, March 4th, 4th through the 13th, and we had just over 1,700 like uh, all adults and just over 900 likely voters. The margin of error for that is 3.4% for all adults and 4.5% for likely voters. That's especially important to consider when you start looking at the, uh, some of the races, the gubernatorial race, for example, um, where we have some, some folks that are kind of tightly clustered. It's important to realize that the 4.5% uh, is a factor there. Uh, we have a front section of the report that focuses on the election, uh, specifically the gubernatorial and the Senate election, as well as congressional elections and some bond measures that will be on the ballot. And in the back half of the report, we look at uh, kind of uh, state and national issues, including opinions of state and federal elected officials, water policy, high-speed rail, state and local tax system, immigration policy, and so on, as, as Deborah mentions. So we'll cut to the chase to what most people are talking about, but I, I do want to mention and kind of echo what, what Deborah said is that we are seeing an increasing number of likely voters saying that they're paying attention to news about candidates. So, you know, today it's, it's 48%. Um, that's still shy of the over six in 10 in March of 2010 that were paying attention, um, which is the last time we had an open seat. Of course, then there wasn't the top two primary, so it was a little bit different. Um, but it is the, f the fact that still just half are paying attention. And so as we get closer to the election and more and more people pay attention, hopefully we'll see that you know, unsure number in our surveys start to dwindle and we'll get a clearer snapshot uh, of, of what the gubernatorial election is, looks like. And it is important to remember that what we're presenting today is a snapshot of, of what we found. Uh, and we look forward to continuing to do this as we get closer to the election. Regarding the race itself, Gavin Newsom uh, has solidified his lead a bit with 28% of likely voters supporting him. Uh, John Cox basically went from 7% to 14%, uh, while Antonio Villaraigosa went from 21% to 9%. Um, it is important to note that a, a change from last survey was the fact that um, we didn't have the ballot designations that each candidate will be using in, in the June primary back in January, and so we used a kind of commonly used job title. Um, and uh, in, in that case, we had a couple of people who were listed by their former job titles, former Los Angeles Mayor Gavin Newsom and former state, uh, Superintendent of State Instruction, Delane Easton. Um, but we did have quite a few people whose job title basically remained the same. Um, John Cox is one of them, and, and we've seen an increase there. So it's important to note that as we go forward, we'll be using the ballot designations that will be on the ballot. Um, we find that uh, Democrats support Newsom by 17 points. Independents uh, are, are um, sorry, and Cox is currently lead, leading Travis Allen by eight points. And so he's kind of uh, inched up among Republicans as well. Um, we also found that 37% of Latino likely voters currently uh, support Antonio Villaraigosa, that's down 11 points from, from January. And we find that 31% of uh, white likely voters support Newsom. Uh, we also find that men and women both prefer Newsom uh, by double digits.
So we're continuing to track how satisfied likely voters are with their choices that they're given. As you can see, just over half of likely voters say they're satisfied with their choices, um, with Democrats much more likely than Republicans or independents to say that they're satisfied. Uh, across racial ethnic groups, satisfaction is roughly similar. Um, San Francisco Bay Area is the most satisfied with 65% being satisfied, and Orange San Diego is the least satisfied with 42%. Um, and across regions, only Orange San Diego falls below half regarding satisfaction. So we also asked folks what their kind of most, imp their top issue they want to hear candidates talk about uh, between now and the June primary. Um, and what we found is that about one in four mentioned immigration is the top issue. Uh, about one in 10 mentioned gun control, guns, gun control or school safety, uh, education in schools, state budget and taxes, as well as jobs in the economy. When we look specifically at the group of likely voters who uh, mention immigration as the issue they most want to hear about, we find that 25% say they will support John Cox, 15% say they will support Travis Allen. So that's about four in 10 of those folks uh, will support a, a Republican candidate. Um, but we also find that 17% would support Newsom, 13% would support Villaraigosa, and in total, 36% say they would support a Democratic candidate. And so what you see is that the people that have immigration at the top of the mind are fairly divided between voting for a Republican or voting for a, uh, a Democrat. So looking at the Senate race, as Dianne Feinstein seeks her fifth full term, we find that she continues to uh, hold a strong lead over uh, Kevin DeLeon. Um, in this case, it's 42 to 16. It was roughly similar in January and December. Um, what we've seen since January was that, you know, there was the uh, California Democratic convention, which there was a lot of buzz about the fact that there wasn't an official endorsement and perhaps that would end up helping Kevin DeLeon. And then, of course, uh, there was the tra tragic events in Parkland, in Parkland, Florida, which then kind of thrust Dianne Feinstein into the national spotlight, kind of pushing uh, for gun control and having a high-profile meeting that was televised. And so what we've seen is that the race really wasn't all that impacted. Um, we do find that uh, two and three Democrats support Dianne Feinstein, uh, while seven in 10 Republicans and four in 10 independent likely voters are undecided on who they'll support. We find that Dianne Feinstein leads by double digits across races and leads by more than a two to one margin across regions. And when we look at the satisfaction, the satisfaction with the candidates in, in this race is, you know, down slightly compared to the, re, the gubernatorial race, um, but we do find that Democrats are kind of equally uh, satisfied, while Republicans are much more likely to be uh, not satisfied. And of course, in this race, uh, we only asked about two candidates because we found that there, while there were significantly more than two candidates, there were only two that were really receiving a significant amount of news coverage and actually had uh, somewhat of an infrastructure moving forward. But we'll continue to monitor that uh, as we move forward. So given the importance that California is being given in the national climate regarding kind of the house races, we wanted to kind of just get a sense of how California likely voters are feeling about midterm elections. And we found that half of Californians say that uh, this midterm election is more important than past, and about half saying it's, it's about the same. This is the first time we've asked this question, so we don't really have a comparison to the past. Um, but we can see that there is 
a bit of an enthusiasm gap between Democrats and Republicans, with nearly six in 10 Democrats saying that this election is more important than past, while about six in 10 Republicans saying that's about the same as past elections. So that'll be important to watch at, as we get closer to the election. Um, women are 10 points more likely than men to say that this election are more important uh, than past election. And uh, right at about 50% in, uh, in, of respondents who live in a district held by Democrats or a district held by Republicans um, actually say that, that this is more important. Um, so with that, I should note that we, we were able to, in this survey, to kind of break out each person into which congressional district they live in. And so we'll be kind of reporting findings sporadically by, by, by those uh, variables as well. And that's also in the crosstabs. So when we look at the generic ballot, we find that uh, Currently, likely voters prefer the Democratic candidate over the Republican candidate by a 14-point margin, 53 to 39. Uh, not too surprisingly, in, in uh, areas where, or with respondents who live in, in Democratic-held districts, six in 10 support the Democrat or lean towards the Democrat, while in Republican districts, nearly six in 10 say that they support the Republican in that district. Um, when we look at compared to adults nationwide, or I should say registered voters nationwide, we find that Californians hold roughly, roughly similar opinions to those in a uh, CNN poll earlier this year. So we'll have at least two bond measures on the ballot. Uh, the first will be in June, Proposition 68. And it's called the uh, Water California Drought, uh, sorry, the California Drought, Water, Parks, Climate, Coastal Protection, Outdoor Access for All bond. Uh, so it's quite a number of things in there, but a lot of that will be focused on the kind of water elements. And when we ask a generic question about uh, would you support a state bond measure for water infrastructure? We find that two and three California, two and three likely voters say they would vote yes, with uh, Democrats more likely than Republicans. But there is at least a majority of Republicans say they support this. There will also be a housing bond on on the on the November ballot, and and that's called the Veterans and uh, Affordable Housing Bond Act of 2018. And we when we ask a generic question about this, we find that about two and three likely voters support it, with, with even more Democrats supporting uh, than the water bond. But we do see a big drop off when it comes to among Republicans, uh, while independent likely voters, about two and three support this. And so this will be interesting to track as we actually decide uh, you know, which, which measures we'll be asking about in, in full, but we wanted to at least get a, a read on kind of the generic idea of, of two measures that we know will be on the ballot. So moving on to the state and national issues, uh, we find that Governor Brown and the legislature continue to have, you know, mostly positive uh, approval ratings. Um, we've, we've seen the governor in the positive for, for, for quite a while now, meaning that more people have approved than disapproved. Um, and, and that's been steady while we've seen that the legislature has, has actually seen quite a bit of an uptake uh, since, since January 2012, if we track back that far. Uh, seven in 10 Democrats approve of Governor Brown, seven in 10 Republicans disapprove. Um, his approval is highest in Los Angeles and San Francisco, not surprising. Um, and we find that uh, regarding the legislature as a whole, we find two and three Democrats approve, three and four Republicans disapprove. On both of these, independents are, are more likely to approve than disapprove. Um, we find that uh, we, we also asked a question about uh, 
your own representative. So how do you feel about the person representing you in, the, in your Senate and state assembly districts? And uh, just about half of like, half of adults approve of this with two and three Democrats approving, seven in 10, Demo seven in 10 Republicans disapproving, and independents are, div are divided. And we've generally found in past surveys that when you ask about this, kind of your own representative, that it, it's at least on par with the legislature. If you, if you go back further, uh, they've tended to be higher when the legislature was lower, so it's a more stable finding, um, because generally speaking, uh, people kind of prefer the person who's, you know, their local representative because it's closer to them. So as Deborah mentioned, we also wanted to kind of come back to water policy. Uh, and we've seen a slight uptick in the, in the share of people saying that, uh, saying that, wa that, the water, that their local water supply is a, is, a, is a big problem since last July. But as you can see, it's not near the levels we saw during 2015 and 2016 uh, when we were in, in the midst of a severe drought. Uh, my water policy uh, colleagues will tell me that we are we are in a drought and that to don't be fooled by by the rain um, but it is uh, interesting in the historical context that it is on the uptick again uh, and we'll probably come back to this in July in our environment survey uh, to continue tracking it uh, we do find that uh, it is lower than in 2015 or 16 uh, we also find that uh, four in 10 or more across regions say that water supply is a problem, a big problem, so that it's kind of across the board with Central Valley slightly more likely to call it a big problem. Um, and we find that pluralities across parties view this as a problem. Um, but we also wanted to ask about the Delta tunnels. This has been the news a lot as of late with the kind of uh, understanding that they're gonna move forward potentially with, with just a single tunnel and then from there add a second in the future if, if that's the way it happens, which it seems like there's a lot of debate about this still. Um, but what we find is that, uh, you know, about half of Californians think that this is very important to the state's future. We find that you know those in the Inland Empire in Los Angeles more likely to call it very important, uh, while those in the Central Valley uh, the least likely to call it very important. We find that uh, this really hasn't shifted from years past, even though we kind of tweak the question ever so slightly to say starting with one tunnel and then adding a second tunnel in the future. The results today are just about the same as they were last year and in previous years. So the fact of whether or not it's a single tunnel or a double tunnel didn't seem to really impact uh, Californians on the broad level. We also wanted to come back to the issue of high-speed rail. It's something that we've been tracking every March uh, for quite a few years now. And it, as it happened, it was actually became a uh, topic of the news while we were actually in the field. Um, when we were going into the field, the, the kind of the last estimate that was provided was about 64 billion. Um, but we knew that there was going to be an increase because of phase one had seen an increase that they come out and publicly stated. Um, but we weren't exactly sure it, when the estimate was going to be coming out. So we said about 70 billion. Um, on the Friday going into the last bit of fielding that we had left, they came out with this about 77 billion, which there were higher estimates upwards closer to 100 billion. Um, but when asked the general question about uh, how important it is, um, in this case, um, we, we asked the first question about the importance of the 
of it without mentioning the dollar amount. And we find that, you know, simil- since 2012, the share saying that is important has ranged from basically 36% to 28%. So there hasn't been a, a big change in the shift saying that the share of people saying it's very important to the state. So as this, as the price has fluctuated, we really hasn't, haven't seen a real change in this. Um, San Francisco residents are the most likely to say that it's, it's very important, while about one in three elsewhere say it's very important. Um, Democrats are more likely than Republicans, and Latinos are the most or more likely than whites to say that uh, the high-speed rail is very important for the state's future. When we look at a question we've been tracking regarding do you favor or oppose uh, kind of building this system, we find that uh, actually 53% today say that they are in favor. That shifts a little bit when you look at likely voters with 52% actually opposed. Um, Democrats, two and three, say that they are in favor um, compared to just 28% of Republicans. And so um, we also asked a follow-up question to those who oppose, would you be willing to support it if it was a lower amount, basically? And what we see is that uh, there, there's an increase from 53% to 72%, um, but about one in four still oppose it, even if the costs were less. Um, so there is a kind of a solid quarter of folks that even if it costs less, they're not going to support it. Um, <laughs> And we find that support is higher among Democrats and is higher among Los Angeles and San Francisco, which of course would be the two kind of metropolitan areas that are linked by the high-speed rail. So as Deborah mentioned, it's tax season. And so uh, just a reminder, April 17th, I believe this year. So uh, make sure you're on top of that. But what we're finding today is that a record high share of of Californians and likely voters are saying that uh, the state and local tax burden ranks near the top compared to other states. Um, This is up 13 points from March of 2016 among adults and 12 points among likely voters. So there has been a shift that we've seen. Um, We find that perception increase the perception that Californians near the top increases with income and with education. Uh, It's higher among Republicans and whites are the most likely to hold this view while Latinos are the least likely to hold this view. Um, Regarding kind of the facts on the ground, the Tax Policy Center says that California ranks 13th uh, in highest state and local tax burden. So um, while nearly half say that we rank near the top. Technically speaking, um, the first 10, I guess, would be near the top. And so we're um, just below that. So, uh, but I, I do think that the reality of it is that, you know, 13th out of 50 is, is still quite high. So I think people are actually perceiving that. Um, but also interesting is that we haven't really seen a big change in the state and local tax burden uh, from the Tax Policy Center when it comes to California. We've always kind of been in this range of, you know, from 11th to 14th range. And so um, the perception has gone up, but the reality really hasn't changed all that much. When we look at the, your, how you feel about how much you personally pay, we find that a majority say that they pay more than they should, with 37% saying they pay much more than they should. Um, as you can see, in this case, uh, those with upper incomes do th- do say that they are that they are paying more. So that does increase with income. But unlike the uh, the kind of perception of the of the state and local burden, there isn't this increase among education. It's it's pretty flat among people of different educational groups when it comes to are you paying more than you should. Um, Republicans are the most likely to say that they pay more than they should. Democrats are the least likely. I know I'm breaking news here on on that finding. Um, 
We also find that African Americans are the most likely to say that they pay more than they should, with half saying they pay much more than they should, which is uh, a double-digit increase compared to other racial ethnic groups, which was quite notable. And Latinos are the least likely to say that they're paying more than they should. Turning to federal elected officials, uh, we see that approval of President Trump remains similar to recent months, and overall there's been very little fluctuation in, in his approval and really the approval of, of, uh, of Congress since January 2017. Um, it's been roughly about a third or about three in 10 um, that has approved of, of his job performance. Uh, today, 78% of Republicans approve, 30% of independents and 8% of Democrats approve. Um, whites are the most likely with 42% with, uh, approving of his job performance, while fewer than three in 10 in other racial ethnic groups approve of his job performance. Uh, approval of Congress is, has seen a little bit of an uptick since, since earlier this year, not a whole lot. And, but we actually find that fewer than one in three across parties actually approve of Congress as a whole. Um, and we find that Asian and Latinos are more like, Asian Americans and Latinos are more likely than whites and African Americans to approve of Congress. And that uh, the approval of Congress goes, uh, goes down as you increase age, education, and income levels. Uh, but compared to adults nationwide, Californians are, are, are more likely to approve of Congress. Uh, a February Gallup poll found that 15% of, of, uh, of adults nationwide approve of Congress. I should add that uh, President Trump's approval rating in the recent Gallup tracking poll was at 39% compared to the 30% here in California. So they're more likely to approve of, of, of President Trump. Looking at our other federal elected officials, uh, as Dianne Feinstein seeks reelection, uh, her approval rating is below 50% among all adults. But if you look at that likely voter finding, it's actually at 54%. Um, so that's very noteworthy. Three in four Democrats approve, uh, just one in four Republicans, and four in 10 independents approve of Dianne Feinstein. Um, when you look at uh, Kamala Harris, the junior senator, you know, four in 10, all, four in 10 uh, among all adults, 45% among likely voters approve. Um, similar patterns regarding the partisan differences, but uh, just six in 10 Democrats approve of her compared to three in four who approve of, of Feinstein. Just 16% compared to 24% of Republicans approve, um, while independents are roughly similar uh, approval between the two. We also find that for both uh, Senator Feinstein and Senator Harris, that approval is highest uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, Bay Area of just over half approving, and lowest in the Central Valley with uh, a, just under four in 10 approving. Regarding uh, kind of your own representative in the House of Representatives, uh, we find that half of Californians and likely voters say that they approve of of their own representative's job performance. So it's quite higher than Congress, which was at 29%. Um, your individual representative is viewed much better. 62% of Democrats approve, 38% of Republicans, and about half of independents. Um, when we look at those seats that are held by Democrats, or those areas held by Democrats, 55% approve of their own representative. When we look at the Republican-held districts, 44% uh, approve of their own representative. So there's about 11 point swing there. So while we were in the field uh, on March 6th, the uh, Department of Justice announced that they were suing California over three immigration laws. 
um, regarding mostly around the sanctuary state elements of, of immigration policy at the state level. And um, what we decided to do is we were already asking about immigration policy, but we thought it was important to kind of have an element that captured how Californians feel about what the state was doing. And so we decided on March 7th, so basically four days into the fielding, three days into the fielding process, to add a question uh, from our January survey that got at kind of if, if Californians favor or oppose state and local governments acting on their own to protect uh, the rights of undocumented immigrants. And what we found uh, is that uh, six in 10 are in favor. Um, that number was 65% in January. And so it's basically unchanged. It's also interesting that, you know, uh, the numbers across the board were basically unchanged. Uh, basically about eight in 10 Democrats were in favor in January, exactly 21% of Republicans were in favor, and about half of independents were in favor. So despite the fact that the federal government came in and took this action, there wasn't an increase or a decrease, which you could make arguments either way um, regarding the potential for a shift. Um, we find that three in four Latinos, as well as two in three Asian Americans and African Americans are in favor of the state taking these actions, while less than half of whites are in favor. Um, we find that support for the state taking its own actions is higher among younger Californians, those with uh, a high school degree or less, and those making less than 40,000, and it increases among, among the other groups. So as we were preparing to go into the field, we, we had had this question picked out, but then of course in the, in the basically the week before, um, there was the uh, raids in Northern California um, that, that occurred, and of course there was Libby Schaff making the announcement on the Saturday, actually this, a full week before we actually were going into the field kind of with this warning, which of course, rose a lot of ear from, from uh, the Department of Homeland Security and President Trump. Um, but, so we feel it's important to ask this question kind of tied to the state question, because this question is different, right? The other one's should the state take these actions, and this is whether or not it's good for the country. And so the, the results are somewhat different, with half saying that it's actually a bad thing for the country, and four in 10 saying it's a good thing. Um, there's the expected partisan divide here with you know, three and four Democrats and eight and 10 Republicans saying, you know, one saying it's good and the other saying it's bad. Um, we find if majorities in Los Angeles and San Francisco say that this is a bad thing, while everywhere else it's very closely divided. Um, interestingly, we find Latinos, of course, find it's say it's a bad thing, as, as you might expect, as well as African Americans, um, but among w whites and among Asian Americans, there's, uh, they're more divided. Um, adults nationwide are more slightly more likely to say uh, that it's a, uh, slightly more likely to say it's a good thing with 46% in a recent ABC Washington Post poll. And so, but overall, um, adults nationwide were definitely more divided than, than Californians. So President Trump <laughs> visited California on the Tuesday, which was basically the last night of our fielding pe uh, period, um, to visit San Diego, to look at the prototypes for the wall. Um, and of course, last night, there was the news that uh, the kind of uh, spending bill coming out of Washington included about $1.8 billion for the border wall. Um, but uh, Californians continue to oppose it. Uh, seven in 10 adults, uh, majorities, solid majorities across regions, um, as well as everywhere basically outside of the Republicans in the state uh, oppose this. This has been 
fairly consistent as we've moved, as we started asking about this in May of 2016. We've probably asked about it five times now, and support has, has basically always hovered around one in four, um, and, and opposition has been around seven in 10. So uh, this has been one of the more steady findings that we've seen over the last couple of years. Um, solid majorities across regions oppose, uh, and interestingly, opposition uh, decreases with increasing age. When you look at the 18 to 34 year olds, 83% uh, oppose building the wall. When you look at those 55 and older, 58% oppose. So that's a pretty substantial shift. But it's important to note that still 58% of those 55 and older oppose the wall. So it's not like it shifted to a majority in favor. Um, in a nationwide poll, uh, support for the wall is, is, is at about 40% um, when it's about one in four in California. So oftentimes, when you're kind of creating a survey, events happen that, that, that cause you to rethink whether or not you need to, if, if you've covered everything that you need to cover. And so, um, of course, as we were preparing to go into the field, there were there events in, in Florida, and so we thought uh, we, we don't have a lot of space in the survey given the kind of time constraints that we can keep kind people like you on the phone, um, but we thought it was very important to, to ask a question about something about gun control or gun laws. And so we went back to a question that we asked last May um, regarding whether or not the sale of guns, the laws covering the sale of guns should be uh, made more strict, less strict, or kept about the same. What we find is that, you know, all adults, strong majorities are actually uh, say that it should be more strict. Um, and of course, nearly all Democrats say it should be more strict, seven in 10 independents. And this month, we actually find nearly half of Republicans. Um, we've seen an increase across the board compared to the May survey, but one of the largest increases was among Republicans where we saw a 20 point increase from 20 per, 28% to 48% um, from last May to today. Overall, there was a 13 point increase among Democrats, there was a 15 point increase, and among independents, there was a 17 point increase. So everyone increased their kind of perception of this. Um, and it should be noted that in the week after, um, the findings will probably uh, be potentially at their highest level. And we hope to come back to this as well as other questions regarding kind of gun control and gun policy later in the year. Um, and it'll be interesting to see kind of where kind of the overall finding as well as some of these partisan groups fall after it's not really top of mind uh, and, and other events have kind of occurred. And, and as often happens, kind of, you know, other things come up. Um, we find that strong majorities across regions and demographic groups say that, say that laws should be more strict. Um, in districts held by Democrats, 77% think they should be more strict. In districts held by Republicans, 63% think they should be more strict. Um, and compared to the nation, we're eight points more likely uh, than adults nationwide in a CBS News poll. And so, uh, not surprising, but th this is the issue that that even adults nationwide seem to fall on the side of that, that there should be something regarding laws being more strict. There's a lot of disagreement about what that should be, um, and we hope to come back to kind of more specific measures as they arise uh, in Congress um, later in the year. So we also wanted to look at the federal tax policy, uh, we hadn't really looked at it since it had been enacted and signed into law. And so we just wanted to get a read on, you know, how, how Californians feel about the tax law. And if you kind of look at this and you think back to what the approval of President Trump was in the slide two or three back, 
not all that different. 30% uh, here approve of the tax law, 30% approved of President Trump, the big partisan divides here. Um, and when we look at adults nationwide in a recent Pew survey, 37% approved compared to the 30% here, not all that surprising. Um, but the kind of familiar divides are, are created here when you compare it to what uh, approval of President Trump was. But when we look at beyond just do you like the law or not, how do you think it's going to impact you? Now, it must be said that, of course, how you feel about the law will in some ways color how you think it will impact you. Um, but what we do find is that while, while solid majorities disapproved of the law, we find that pluralities actually say that the effect of, of the law will be mostly negative, um, with 42%, about four in 10 adults and, and likely voters. We find you know, a majority of Democrats say that will be mostly negative, and we find that uh, half of Republicans say it will be mostly positive, um, with four in 10 independents saying it will be mostly negative. Um, majorities of African Americans and Latinos say that the effect will be mostly negative, um, compared to about one in three uh, whites and Asians. And uh, adults nationwide were, were much more divided on this, um, with a third being the plurality saying that it won't have much of an effect. Um, and so this is also something that we want to track now, but that we'll definitely come back to as the effect of the law is, is felt more. I mean, obviously most people have seen some change in their kind of weekly or biweekly or whatnot paycheck, but now that kind of people are doing taxes, we'll come back to it later in the year again um, as we move forward. So to kind of wrap up, um, Gavin Newsom has solidified his lead in the gubernatorial process as John Cox has gained ground and Villaraigosa has fallen back a bit. Important to note that, that there's you know a 4.5 margin of, percent margin of error there, as well as the fact that this is a snapshot in time. Um, Feinstein continues to lead uh, De Leon by double digits with a third of likely voter with with. Sorry, nearly four in 10 likely voters undecided. Um, half of likely voters say that the midterms this year is more important than past, while about half say that it's about the same. Um, Democrats much more likely than Republicans to say that, this is, uh, that these midterms are much more important. Um, a record high share of Californians, 49% and 58% of likely voters, say that the state and local tax burden is near the top compared to other states. Um, and as federal and state tensions continue to rise, especially over immigration, we find that Californians have continued to support the state taking action to, uh, to um, protect the rights of undocumented immigrants. And we also find that a record high share, share of Californians with a double digit increase from last May say uh, that they support stricter gun laws. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions that you may have. Yes. Your likely voters stress about less than 1,000. What is the voting population, knowing that California is somewhere in 40 million, what is the voting population? meaning like a demographic makeup. Uh, the, the makeup is that, uh, you know, roughly speaking, those who are, who are more affluent, who are more educated, who have lived in their houses for, for a longer period of time, so they haven't moved and had to re-register. Um, it tends to be wider than the overall population. It tends to be uh, less, uh, people of color than the, or sorry, I should say less brown than the kind of overall population. Um, in this survey, it was 61% of likely voters were, uh, were white and 19% were Latino. Uh, that's not that far off from kind of uh, 
what we found in the past and what kind of exit polls have shown in general. Uh, but um, I don't have any other specific numbers off the top of my head for this particular survey, but then in general, our likely voters tend to be, there's normally a, a if there normally is a, a few more Republicans, comparatively speaking, to registered voters in general, but the Democrats still make up the larger share overall. Yes. Oh, right here. Oops. Oh. Oops. Yes. Uh, two questions. One yes. is that um, you said that Villaraigosa's Latino vote went down by 11 points. Yes. And I was wondering where his vote was dispersed amongst the other candidates. And the second question, more a process question, is I, I, I noticed you guys are using cell phones a lot more. Yes. Appropriate. Is the refusal rate on cell phones higher than landlines? Yes. Um, regarding kind of where the, the Via Ragosa voters went, um, I haven't done a lot of looking at this, but obviously Newsom has gone up five points. In a lot of the groups where Villaraigosa was doing uh, slightly better than Newsom, we've seen Newsom kind of take over. And so he's gained ground among Latinos. He's kind of solidified a little bit larger of a, of a lead among Democrats um, and some of kind of the other groups that you might expect to be more Democratic. He's actually caught up more in Los Angeles, which is interesting, and so we'll continue to track that. Regarding the refusal rates, uh, kind of overall contact rates and like getting people to decide to do a survey has dropped f a lot over the years. Um, but I, I can't necessarily speak that it, that the kind of the ability to do a survey um, has been disproportionately affected with cell phone. We do know that cell phone interviews, uh, much to our kind of chagrin, take longer to do for probably a number of reasons. You can't use an automatic dialer, so you have to hand dial. You can't use, um, obviously it's harder to hear. People drop calls, you have to call back. And so generally speaking, those interviews take longer. And so as we've kind of now up to 70% of our interviews on cell phone, it's kind of, the good thing is we're calling more people on cell phones, so the people we're contacting is more, are more representative. The bad news is that we can't ask as many questions now as we used to because those interviews just take a little bit longer. And so, yes. Um, I have a question with regard to the high-speed rail. Yes. Um, so do you think that respondents' uh, answers would have changed if you would have given them the full spectrum of not just the costs of high-speed rail, but also um, the time delays that keep going up, and as well as the fact that it won't actually be high-speed rail, and will you uh, be more um, intentional about informing uh, respondents about that in the future? Yes, I, I, would, I would anticipate that you would probably get a, a slightly different response if you if you mention the time delays and the uh, and as well as the kind of speed concerns that that are out there, um, our kind of protocol in asking this has always been to kind of provide the latest information regarding the cost as well as kind of a descriptive that was you know that kind of describes what the people voted on. Um, and then go from there. Um, unfortunately, we're not able to spend, you know, four or five questions on high-speed rail um, just because there's so much else that we're tasked with kind of looking at. But that is definitely valuable if we are going to spend some more time to say that, you know, it's not going to be completed. It would be one part that's changing. And then also the, you know, comparative speed to other nations or train systems is definitely a, a valid point. Um, but we've kind of also value the fact that we have a tracking question that we've been able to track over time. And so as the cost is going up, we haven't really seen a huge 
shift in the, in the share of people saying they favor it. And in fact, this month was, I believe, tied for a record high at 53% saying that, that they're in favor, despite the fact that the costs have gone to 70 billion. So, but that's definitely valid. And if we have more time, we would definitely like to dive into that deeper. Yes. Anything else? Yes. Uh, uh, somewhat a similar question to the previous one. It, a lot of these topics, there is a lot of information that may or may not be widely held in the public. I would say the, the tax, the federal tax reform could be another one. I mean, my, I, I would guess that if somebody's below 120, 130% of median household income in California, they'll probably, especially if they're renters, they'll probably see a tax cut from this. So I was surprised to see the, I mean, the, the stat where m most people think that they're going to be negatively affected. Unless those are all high income taxpayers, I'd say that's probably mostly incorrect. And yeah. it seems like there is value to, as a similar question had, it, it, you know, I, I get the value of a tracking question, but a follow-up question to say, you know, here's some basic facts about it. Does that change your perception? That seems like that would be a very value added thing to yeah. have as part of the survey. Yeah. but. I mean, you don't do that, I guess, for space limitations or resource limitations, or it, it seems like that would add a lot of value. I guess I'm more curious about why you don't do something like that. Um, well, regarding the tax policy question, I think it's, it's a question that obviously individuals feel the impact very differently. And so we, there's actual data out there that's going to show kind of how Californians are impacted by it. But we just wanted to get how people perceive it, right? Because from, in a lot of ways, it, it, perception is reality. And so if you feel this way, then it's going to impact how you, how you vote on things. It's going to impact a number of different things. Um, but we do obviously know that, that there are a lot of, just looking at the in income breakdown and knowing a little bit about the law, you can kind of say that some of those people that say it's a negative impact are actually going to be more beneficial, have, are going to benefit from it. Um, but our kind of job here is to kind of, I think, to gather the perception and where possible to provide information or to, or to also what we also do sometimes is to ask people, um, how much would you say you know about this so that we can actually collect the information on kind of, if people say that they, you know, don't know anything about it, then n not that their opinion means less, but that the people who say they know a lot, their opinions may actually be, you know, um, somewhat more representative of, of an informed person. But I do think it's beneficial to know how people perceive it, regardless of, of, of whether or not, in reality, you know, if I say that I'm, it's, it's going to affect me negatively, but I know that it kind of, it, it hasn't as of yet. So um, I think there's still value in that, but I do see where you're coming from. Yeah. Yes. 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 One question, a possible follow-up. So this was likely June voters? This... So our, our sample is all adults, and then right now we are, um, then we break out questions by, by likely voters. As we get closer to the election and as more people follow news, we'll see a, a kind of shifting of the types of people that actually make it into our likely voter screen. Um, because our likely voter screen, it's, it's basically a screen. We're not necessarily... Uh, putting a propensity for someone to vote or not. It's just a, a kind of a, a model or algorithm that kind of dictates whether or not someone will, will we think at this point in time, be a likely voter. Um, yes? So the congressional district um, generic ballot question, yes. was that likely November or likely June? At this point, we have a, a single likely voter model. And so, um, as we get closer to the election, it may change as we go into the fall. But at this point, especially you know, with with fewer than half 
paying attention to news. This is the model that we've kind of used in the past with, with um, a decent amount of success, I'd say. Yeah, depending on how you define success. Yes. I'd like to thank everyone today. And uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to come up. Thank you.